Thanks, Maya. So again, my name is Joanne Garten, and I work with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, I guess I'll ask you, Maya, for the next slide, please. And in our program, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to municipalities about all kinds of things regarding trees and public ways and public places. But often those folks who uh, speak with us um, are also private landowners, even though they may have a municipal hat on when they, um, when they approach the urban and community forestry program. Um, so I'm excited to be able to share a, a, some things about ash tree identification and management in this first part section of our presentation. So ash trees in Vermont are super common and they are um, a, a really important keystone species in, in our forests in Vermont. Approximately five to 7% of the trees statewide are part of the ash genus. So that's green, black, and white ash. And that could be something like 160 million ash trees. So likely if you're um, managing some forest land of any size, uh, you are probably looking at an ash tree somewhere in there. Not definitely, but probably. Um, of course, ash trees don't occur in the even distribution throughout the landscape. Some stands, forest stands are particularly high in ash trees, even 70% forested in ash. Next slide, slide please. We as a program and certainly in forest parks and recreation look at ash trees in the forest and that even includes rural roadside forests. And it's important now as we think about managing uh, any forest for ash trees um, and ash tree health to know that because of emerald ash borer, there, there is a threat to ash tree and ash tree longevity because of this invasive beetle. And it really is the municipalities and the private landowners and state entities on state land who are managing how emerald ash borer will really roll out um, uh, in the landscape. There's not really a federal top-down approach much anymore um, regarding this forest pest. Next slide, please. Ash trees in urban settings are um, very common, and you may be seeing those in some places that you live or work or play. Particularly green ash have often been planted as monocultures along streets, really robust um, urban trees. But of course, they were planted maybe in the 60s, 70s, uh, even more recently, uh, without knowing that emerald ash borer was on its way to affect many of these trees. Next slide, please. So ash trees, what do they look like? I wanna just cover this very quickly uh, with everyone, but know that you're welcome anytime to ask questions about identifying ash trees. Next slide, please. The most distinctive thing to notice about ash trees is really happening right now, now that the leaves are off of the trees, is the form of ash. Now ash are oppositely branched, which means that along a stem, branches come on completely uh, grow completely opposite each other. Next slide, please. So zooming in, you can see that a little bit here where um, instead of the uh, branches operating alternately, you see them opposite each other. Maple trees have this same pattern, but ash trees have a super stout uh, form to them. Their branches are very thick and even getting down to the, the, the smaller twigs, they're not wispy, they're quite stout, fat fingers along these trees. Next slide, please. Knowing your ash is going to be a big part of managing uh, forest landscapes in light of emerald ash borer. So there's many um, defining characteristics in addition to that form, but I'd certainly encourage you to spend some time in the woods, especially on a clear leaf off day, to recognize that form, that stout oppositely branched form from far away. We have a lot of resources regarding the, the leaves and the leaflets, the flowers, particularly the, the third slide from the left there, the seeds of an ash tree are these singular samaras, and they only occur on female trees. You may see them at this time of year um, hanging on in great abundance in these kind of brownish clusters up in the top of the tree. I think I have one more slide. Next slide, please. I mentioned briefly that there are three species of native ash here in Vermont. White ash is particularly common um, in our forest settings, and that's on the left there, has that distinct diamond-shaped furrowed bark. Often confused, if you're just looking at the bark with green ash, you'll see that on the far right side. Um, this is often found more in the Champlain Valley area, and as I mentioned, was 
commonly planted in urban areas. In the middle there, we see some black ash bark, which looks very distinctly different from its uh, white and green ash cousins. But um, and we'll learn quite a bit more about the importance of black ash in the landscape. But just note that it is still an ash tree. It's still hugely affected by emerald ash borer and has um, a pretty different bark, although the form of the tree is much the same. And next slide, please. I'll pass it off to Judy now to talk about some basics of emerald ash borer. Hi. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about some EAB basics like the life cycle, the symptoms you can look for, and what impact this insect has on the ash trees. Next slide. Um, the um, life stages uh, is what I'm going to show you in the next two slides. So the eggs are in the upper left. They're tiny, and they're laid by the females on the outside of the um, ash trees. They're very difficult to see. Um, and she lays them in little groups of like three to six up to a total of about 70. Um, those larvae hatch and the small larvae chew their way into the tree and start their feeding and the rest of their life cycle. They go through four instars or four larval stages um, and then they become what's called a pre-pupa. Now most insects do egg, larval stages, pupa and adult, but emerald ash borer have this interesting pre-pupal stage. Um, they're also known as J larva because you can see on that bottom picture, they look like a J. Next slide. Um, and then you'll see on the left is an actual emerald ash borer pupa um, and the adult. So they emerge um, in the spring from the pupal form to the adult. Next slide, please. This is a schematic of the whole life cycle process. And what I'd like you to note is that at any given time um, in a tree, there can be many different life stages uh, in progress. The population of emerald ash borer doesn't develop and go through its life stage in synchrony. They can do it at, in separate timing. The um, size of the tree and the uh, chemical defenses it's able to bring to bear on these insects can, can delay their development. So uh, it can take from one to two years from the insects to go through their whole life cycle. So once they've um, hatched and they chew their way into the tree, they're going to eat and grow and molt, eat and grow and molt. Um, they can overwinter in their larval form or as a J larva or as a pupa. And then they'll emerge from the pupa as adults in the spring and chew their characteristic D-shaped exit hole into the bark, fly into the canopy, feed, mate, and lay eggs. Next slide, please. This is what the um, insects look like when they're actually in the tree. And you can see they basically are feeding in the, in the phloem or the, right in the cambial layer. So that sort of orange looking bark where it goes to white, that's where you're gonna find them. And then the slide on the right, you can see the actual, what we call serpentine or S-shaped galleries. And you'll notice at the bottom, they start out like skinny and tiny, and then the insect will feed and then it will molt and be bigger. So the galleries get a little bigger and they keep going through that process. So you start with skinny galleries and they become bigger and then they lead to an exit hole. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for the tree and how does this affect the tree? So you can see in this slide um, that for the first couple of years of infestation, it's pretty difficult to visually from the outside tell that there's an, that there's an insect feeding on the tree. So that top row is showing a sort of schematic of what you're gonna see. Um, and then the next row shows the corresponding approximate amount of larval galleries to cause the kind of damage you'd see in the tree. So the phloem is where the um, products of photosynthesis are moved up and down the tree. And eventually the tree becomes girdled and the tree can't really feed itself because its circulatory system is shut off is essentially what happens. Um, and you see in the bottom row of pictures that what that's gonna look like in an actual tree. So it can take, again, depending on the size and health of the tree, anywhere from one to eight years for the tree to die. Uh, next slide, please. I should mention, speaking of dying trees, that um, ash 
can be can break in unpredictable directions and be very difficult to work with when they're dead and dying. So you're best off um, if you're planning to remove, you know, harvest or do anything with the trees to do it while they're still alive. Uh, next slide, please. The overall impact on the ash population is not good. We're seeing um, 80 to almost 100 percent mortality. This is um, mitigated if green ash are present, but um, this is work that was done in um, Michigan on some research plots that have been monitored since we found emerald ash borer in, um, in 2002 over there. So if, the, if there's green ash and natural enemies, then that takes the pressure off of the white ash, at least temporarily, because eventually the green ash are going to be killed off. Next slide, please. Um, so how can you tell if you have this insect on your property? Um, I'm going to run through some signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer in ash. Next slide, please. Um, one of the best ones to look for is woodpecker holes. Um, so if you see those, um, take a closer look. Next slide, please. In addition to the woodpecker pecked holes, you also have what's called flecking, where they fleck off little bits of bark. You see on the left, that can happen around the woodpecker holes. But if you look on the photo on the right, it can make the entire ash tree look orange. So if you see a tree like that, that's a good one to go inspect more closely. Next slide, please. Um, these are more of the galleries, which you saw earlier. So S-shape, pretty unique to emerald ash borer if you see it in an ash tree. Next slide. Another thing you can, you'll find on trees that are infested with emerald ash borer are bark cracks. And sometimes you don't need to peel the bark off the tree. You can just look through the crack and see those S-shaped galleries. Next slide, please. Um, another symptom is what's called epicormic branching or sprouting, where the tree is um, doing an emergency um, production of, of these sprouts and branches to increase its photosynthetic surface area because it's not, it can sense it's not getting what it needs to the tree canopy. Um, and it's trying to find a way to solve that problem. Next slide, please. So these are the characteristic D-shaped exit holes. They can be mistaken for other um, native insects, but if the insect is handily right in there, then that makes identification so much easier. Next slide, please. So how do you know if you should be looking for emerald ash for signs and symptoms, or if you um, need to start managing your trees? If you go to uh, vtinvasives.org, that's our sort of go-to site for invasives. Um, if you look on the EAB pages, you'll see this interactive map. So this map, you can zoom in and find your town on it. And the circles represent um, a 10-mile radius around the center of the inf infestation. Um, and the dark red color indicates the severity of the infestation. So that's central Vermont is where we first found EAB in Vermont, and it's our largest and most severe infestation. Um, so if your town is within that 10 mile radius, you really need to think about what you wanna do with your ash trees. You know, If you're gonna treat them, harvest them, leave them alone, um, whatever. But if you go to vtinvasives.org, you have the tool that will tell you um, what your risk level is, basically how close you are to an infestation. And I think at this point, I am turning um, the slides over to the next speaker. Thank you. Oops. Um, I think there's just, hi everyone, I'm Charlotte Cotto and I'm gonna be talking about black ash in just a moment. Um, but there is one more sign or symptom, which is just canopy thinning. Um, and Judy showed that in some of her earlier slides. Um, Judy, I don't know if you wanted to touch on this before we continue. No, I think it just is a duplicate that got in there somewhere. Sorry about that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Maya, we can go on to the next slide. One more, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Charlotte Cotto, and I'm a master's student in the UVM Field Naturalist Program. 
Um, for my master's project, I'm working with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program to do a combination of outreach and research on Vermont's black ash trees. This tree is also called brown ash, hoop ash, swamp ash, and basket ash. Um, North America's emerald ash borer infestation is now at least 20 years underway, and so far there hasn't been any resistance detected in black ash trees. So it's likely that black ash will disappear from its range throughout northeastern North America. What are the implications of this black ash, this likely black ash extinction event? Um, there are really two areas to discuss. The first is the cultural significance and the second ecological. First, wherever black ash are found, they have close ties to the indigenous peoples. And before sharing more, I want to quickly recognize that I am not indigenous and that the information that I'm sharing comes from a combination of personal communication and research. So for the Abenaki people of Vermont, black ash bear a deep cultural importance. Um, in the Wabanaki creation story, it's told that Abenaki people emerged from the ash. And black ash is an integral component in traditional basket making practices as well as other, um, other crafts. So in an intensely physical process, suitable basket trees are felled and then pounded into splints. And you can see this pounding process on the bottom left. Um, at, this, is, this picture is from an event that happened in the Nulhegan Basin this past spring. So when, when those uh, logs are pounded, they split along the growth rings and the continuous grain of black ash trees creates long, thin, strong, and supple strips of wood called splints. Those splints are then used for basketry and other crafts, or it can be used, um, stored for future use. The lower right-hand picture on this slide displays a basket that was made by Carrie Wood, who's a member of the Nulhegan Band of the Kusik Nation, um, the Kusik Abenaki Nation. Needless to say, as black ash disappears, there are significant cultural repercussions for indigenous communities around the Northeast. Moving on to ecological significance now, um, black ash is often found in nutrient-rich wet seeps, swamps, drainages, and floodplains. And because these trees are able to retain a lot of water, um, they can help to mediate the hydrologic regimes during wet seasons. And as the species disappears from local and regional ecosystems, the forests will lose some of their capacity to handle wet periods. Without black ash, hydrological changes are expected to shift some forested wetlands towards more shrub dominated landscapes because um, the conditions are likely to become too wet for other tree species to establish. Black ash also plays some other important ecological roles like nutrient cycling and creating wildlife habitat. So a few quick thoughts for landowners with black ash on their properties, or maybe you have a neighbor who has black ash. Um, if you have black ash trees on your property, the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program is currently piloting a form intake system to connect landowners with basket makers. So if you're open to having basket makers harvest trees on your property, you can fill out the form. If you're not open to harvest, um, or you just wanna to contribute to Black Ash Awareness in other ways, there's a community science project that we've been working on um, on iNaturalist that's tracking both the distribution and health of Vermont's black ash trees. It's pretty easy to contribute um, an observation. You just take a picture and add a couple of details and then upload the geo-reference picture to the platform. And links to both of these resources will be shared um, in a handout that will be sent out after the webinar. From now I'm gonna hand it over to Joanne Garten to talk a little bit about ash management. Thanks, Charlotte. So black ash are um, one piece and kind of different piece of this entire story of ash tree management on your land. Um, and again, I'll, I'll stress that just knowing what ash trees look like and how the species differ from each other is really a big part of this uh, outreach presentation. And I think still a very valid question for, for all landowners to ask, is this tree an ash tree? Um, and I will say that because our program focuses a lot on municipal ash tree management, so ash tree management in public ways and places, my slant to thinking about that management is um, certainly based on part of the idea that some ash trees 
when dead or dying will pose more risk than other ash trees solely because of their location, um, perhaps because of their species too. As Judy mentioned, white ash are showing some more um, tolerance of emerald ash borer, but it's still not an easy story for all ash trees to, to survive this infestation. So just to think about the types of management strategies that you are considering, maybe not all over your property, but in certain sections, um, or you're talking about with your towns, is any kind of immediate or preemptive action, whether that's removing a healthy tree because you know it will be uh, unsafe or difficult or expensive to remove when it is infested, or considering treatment of those trees. Um, insecticide treatment is a highly effective a way to protect an ash tree from emerald ash borer invasion. Of course, this is the highest um, upfront cost of any type of ash tree management. Most of us will probably think about selective management, monitoring some of these trees to see how they're doing, keeping track of where EAB is in your region statewide, treating some trees with insecticide, not treating other trees with insecticide, thinking about zones or places, maybe near your home or a driveway or along trails or a place where you know that your property is bounding, uh, is at a boundary with another uh, high use area. There's a lot of different ways to manage the risk posed by these ash trees. And to think of course that if there is very little risk, there are so many good reasons to leave ash trees up in the forest, um, to not treat or cut them down, but to let them play out in the landscape um, as we see emerald ash borer roll through. And the last management type is really reactive or delayed management. And in areas that are high use, either with people actively being there or structures or homes or roads, um, this can be certainly a more dangerous approach to ash tree management. We have no control over whether or not the trees become infested uh, and when and how quickly they die and even which way they fall because they're, they are so brittle. Next slide, please. I did want to touch on um, insecticide treatment. The, the text is a little funny there um, to say that uh, this is a, a super effective way of treating ash trees that you know you want to preserve from emerald ash borer infestation. Um, and it's appropriate for healthy and high value ash trees. And how you decide what high value means to you um, is going to be a subjective process. This is a picture of someone um, injecting the trees through small holes about every three inches along the base of the trunk of the ash tree with a syst systemic insecticide that contains one of two um, active ingredients being amomectin benzoate or azadiractin. There are other products that you can buy or use or have someone else use on your property, but products containing these two active ingredients are the ones that the state recommends for a host of reasons, including that they are um, not neonicotinoids. Uh, application of these, these insecticides can be done by you on your own property, so not on other people's property, but on your own. Um, but as you can see, it requires specialized equipment. Um, it requires training on how to do this without injuring the tree in any other way. So what uh, we are mostly recommending is that even for private landowners that you consider contacting uh, someone who's uh, certainly a Vermont pesticide applicator certified, and ideally someone who is also a certified arborist or who has a certified arborist on staff to be able to implement this process uh, safely and effectively for both the tree and the, app and the person doing the application. And just to note that insecticide treatment, while very effective in the high 90% effective at, at uh, making sure a tree does not die from emerald ash borer infestation by killing the larvae in the tree, it is a long-term commitment that has to be done every two to three years over the life of the tree. So probably uh, when you stop treating that tree will also be when the tree becomes susceptible to emerald ash borer again. There's a quick website on the bottom there, treesaregood.com, that can help you find an ISA certified arborist in your region. And you're welcome to reach out to the Urban and Community Forestry Program to um, touch base with us and see a handful of our resources about helping you find someone uh, nearby who holds all these certifications. Next slide, please. And I think I pass it back to Judy here.
Uh, sorry, I'm not next on the list. Um, wasn't it um, Peter who was going next? Oh, maybe it's me here then, just stating to not uh, to not move firewood. I guess this is what this slide is about. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and just noting that that there's a lot of ways that we can consider managing ash trees both on our own land, selectively, proactively, reactively, but there really is a huge um, reason to not encourage the spread of emerald ash borer. As you saw from the, the map of where emerald ash borer is in the state, it's in a lot of places. It's probably in other places where it hasn't been detected, but it's also, there are regions of the state with huge swaths of healthy ash, and there's lots of reasons to not bring emerald ash borer to those areas. And buying firewood, ash firewood, and moving it somewhere else, tens, hundreds of miles, um, is the easiest way to spread both emerald ash borer and other forest pests. So buy it where you burn it. Um, don't move firewood still is a really important message regarding the, uh, slowing the spread of emerald ash borer. Now the next slide, please. I do pass it to Sharp. Awesome. Thanks, Joanne. Um, just getting my video started. Okay. So I'm going to touch briefly on emerald ash borer biocontrol efforts, which is a more landscape level management approach. Um, and it's being headed by the USDA Plant Protection Program. They are funding an effort to establish populations of wasps, of parasitic wasps that parasitize emerald ash borer. Um, they are native to Northeastern Asia, the um, native range of emerald ash borer as well. And in Vermont, um, state land agencies are distributing those wasps on state lands. So far, Vermont's Forest Protection Program has released wasps in L.R. Jones State Forest, um, in South Hero, and at Whipstock Hill WMA in Bennington, Vermont. Starting next year, the state will begin monitoring the parasitoid population levels and the dispersal of these populations. The goal is to develop sufficient levels of parasitoid populations to slow the spread of emerald ash borer and to give native ash trees a little more time to respond and adapt to the infestation. Depending on the species, these wasps attack either the emerald ash borer eggs or larvae, um, the life stages that Judy showed us earlier. So the three species are Spathius gallinae, which is a larval parasitoid with a pretty long ovipositor, and they can parasitize larvae in ash trees that are up to about 23 inches diameter at breast height. They are transported as adults in plastic cups, which is the picture on the lower right. The second species is O. obius agrili. Um, these wasps inject their eggs into the emerald ash borer eggs, thereby killing the host eggs. Um, only females of this species are released and because they can reproduce without mating. They arrive in pill bottles, which are called oobinators, um, where they exist as mature pupae and emerald ash borer eggs. This is the picture on the lower left. Um, and the third species is Tetrasticus planipenisi, um, which is another larval parasitoid. And because they have a smaller ovipositor, they can only penetrate into ash trees with diameters that are less than six inches. Um, the Tetrasticus arrive in bolts of ashwood, which contain parasitized emerald ash borer larvae. And that is the picture on the upper right. The picture on the upper left is a box containing like over a thousand um, individual wasps that was sent by the USDA to um, a Vermont employee. So it's important to note that these biocontrol releases are not currently available to private landowners and they are only being administered by state land managers. And with that, I'm handing it over to Peter. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, a lot of great information for people to consider as they um, figure out what to do with their ash. And <clears throat> back in 2018, when the ash infestation map looked like the one you see on the left there. A lot of people were asking, what should I do? When should I start doing things? When should I act? And now that the map looks like the one that Judy showed earlier and is shown here on the right, I think the answer for a lot of people in Vermont is the time is now. And for a couple of reasons, some of which have been, um, have been covered already and are shown in this 
um, quote here from someone who went through it in New York. There are both safety reasons and economic reasons. If you're, if you're working with live wood, it's going to be safer taking trees down if you have to remove trees. Um, and if you've got a, an active good ash market before a lot of ash <clears throat> are being removed from the forest, um, that's going to have economic benefits. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what you want to do as your first acts uh, to deal with EAB, and that's what we've been talking about here, sort of assessing, prioritizing, and planning. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on our work on property that Vermont Land Trust owns. Um, and so in the next slide, I just want to sort of expand a little bit on what uh, Joanne talked about and, you know, and recognize that a lot of people sort of feel helpless in this because you don't know when EAB is going to show up. You don't know how bad the infestation is going to be and how bad it's going to be in your woods. You don't know if there's anything you can do to help out. So if you want to try to gain a little bit of that control, consider doing <clears throat> what Joanne talked about a little bit and go out and do a little project in your backwoods. Look at those areas where people are going to most likely going to be so trails and landings and other special spots on your property. Assess trees that are within about a tree length of that so 80 feet ish from those areas and look at their health. Do they look good? Are they nice and healthy or do they have sort of broken limbs and they're dying back a little bit or they got rot in them? Uh, look for EAB signs um, that Judy and, and Joanne talked about and look for other things like is the, is the tree leaning over a trail or away from the trail? Does it have a hole in it that some critter is using um, for a nesting spot? And then once you have all this information, you can prioritize which trees are the highest risk and which ones you want to take down, which ones you want to leave behind, and you've gained a little bit of that control back. Um, moving on, uh, the next slide, I want to start to talk about what um, you do in the, in the greater woods. And so the first and most important thing is this message that we heard early on that to stop emerald ash borer, you need to cut all your ash trees. And that is just complete bunk. It's just not true. All that's going to do is kill all your ash trees. Um, they actually did some research that shows that trying to remove all the ash trees when EAB moves into an area actually accelerates the spread because it forces the insects to fly further to get to their next host tree. So let's just completely forget about that message of you need to cut all your ash. And in the next slide, another message I'd like to get across is uh, it's not a lost cause. Um, there is hope, especially for white ash. Um, Another study that was done in Michigan by the same folks, they went back and looked at over 800 trees on a number of sites that have been heavily infested by EAB. And of those 800 trees, 800 plus trees, 75% of them were still alive and were still healthy. Now, we don't know that that's going to be the case here in Vermont, of course, but it is reason for hope. And it's a reason for us to continue to manage ash um, so they're a part of the future of Vermont's woodlands. So in the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about what you and your forester can't do necessarily and what you can start to talk about what you can do. There's, there's no silvicultural treatment that you can do, you no know, thinning or other kind of, of harvesting that's going to improve the chances for sort of the, the larger more mature trees in your woods. So you're going to have to make a decision about those trees. And there'll be trade-offs, ec ecological and economic trade-offs. <clears throat> so this has been alluded to already. But if you decide to leave them, it will have pretty significant ecological benefits. So those trees, those ash trees, are often the biggest trees in the woods. And if they are killed by EAB, they'll first turn into large snags and then they'll fall down and be large coarse woody material on the ground. And both those things are really absent on a lot of acres in Vermont and they're really important for ecological uh, health. So you get that benefit if you leave them behind. The economic piece um, 
<clears throat> the, the economic hit that you take will depend a little bit on obviously how much ash and how good the ash is on your stand. But we did a, a small experiment on a property that Dan Kilborn, another forester at VLT, was managing in the northern part of the state. And as part of this timber sale, he had a 12 acre area uh, on that 12 acres, about 7% of the tree of the stocking was white ash. <clears throat> and he figured out that when he was done, he had left something like $540 worth of ash stumpage on that 12 acres. So he had left behind about $45 per acre in value. So not a whole lot. Over a large area, maybe it's a bigger deal, but when you offset that with what we were talking about before, the significant ecological values, there really is, um, there are reasons to, to leave that behind or at least leave some of them behind. Um, <clears throat> so one of the best things you can do to sustain ash through this, and we'll see, talk about it a little on the next slide, is, is to regenerate ash. And it seems a little counterintuitive to uh, want to bring more ash into the forest when EAB is here. But the idea is you get them started now and there'll be seedlings and small saplings at a time when they're, they're too small for the EAB to actually uh, infest them, the EAB wave will move through, their population will crash, and you'll have this new cohort of ash in the understory. And hopefully by that time, we'll have a better understanding of how to control EAB. So how are we going to regenerate ash? <clears throat> and, you know, it's the same way we always have. So if you're talking to your forester, talk to them about looking at and trying to find places where you can regenerate ash. And you're going to do that um, using good silviculture. So one of those, one aspect of that is trying to match species to site. If you have ash growing on really dry sites or overly wet sites, I'm talking about white ash here, um, they're probably not doing very well and they're a little off site, so it's fine. You should just maybe take those ash trees out and transfer that growing space to species that are more suited to that particular site. If you have ash growing on a good site, then you wanna promote regeneration by making openings in the woods, openings that are probably a quarter of an acre or bigger, because although ash can germinate, as seeds can germinate in shade, once they become uh, saplings and they're trying to move up into the canopy, they really need access to full sun. So you're gonna need to make some openings. You do that by prioritizing, removing the, the stress trees. Those are also the ones that EAB is gonna home in on first. They're gonna sense those stress hormones and go to those trees first. So take those out, leave your healthier trees, try to uh, improve the species and structural diversity of the stand. So everybody, I think, understands the species diversity part, but the structural diversity, what I'm talking about there is making sure that you have trees of a bunch of different sizes and ages. You have a shrub layer, you have herbs, you have uh, snags in the overstory, and you have down woody material, excuse me, material on the ground. Um, creating some of that sort of complex structure is important for a really healthy ecosystem. And as was mentioned before, if you're going to do this, you're going to regenerate, you're going to need to know which trees are your female trees. Only the female ones have uh, seeds on them. And ash are a little different in that there are male trees and female trees. So if you go out, as Joanne said, you can go out uh, in the summer, even right now, and if you see those seeds, seed clusters up in the tops of the trees, those are the females. Make sure you mark them in some way so you know what are the males, what are the females. Try to keep uh, the females at about a three to one ratio, so three females for every male. They're wind pollinated, so uh, one male can actually um, service quite a few uh, female trees and favor the healthiest trees. Again, can't stress that enough. Um, and this last slide um, 
I would say I could go on for this for hours, but you are going to get a link tomorrow or at some point in the follow-up email. And I highly recommend that you check out the, this webinar. It was done by Tony D'Amato from UVM. It's really informative and it's well worth your time. So definitely have a look at that, but don't do it until after you've filled out your survey. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. So uh, we've talked about up until, now, up until now, Joanne talked to us about using insecticides to prefer, preserve high value trees in your yard or maybe your favorite ash tree. Um, but I'm gonna talk about a strong case that's been made for treating groves of ash trees within a forested setting with the goal of conserving the genetic diversity of ash species. This, can, uh, this type of work can really complement the forest management work that Peter just shared with us. Um, in fact, on three properties that VLT owns, where we're managing for the conservation of ash, we're also treating groups of 20 ash trees to ensure that they'll live to produce seed well into the future. So this work of treating these groves of ash um, for genetic diversity is really based on the research of um, authors Flower et al. from 2018, where this group of authors investigated the gen genetic diversity of white ash in particular um, in the Allegheny National Forest, which um, is in Northwestern Pennsylvania, to get a little location on that. And their goal was to identify optimal strategies for preserving genetic diversity within white ash. And what they found was that it's better to treat more populations rather than more trees per population. And this has an added benefit um, of protecting against losses. You think here kind of wind, ice, these are disturbances that could, could cause death of ash trees. And so this also protects against that as well. Um, we've really been, this work has really been led by New Hampshire who's been treating groves of trees, of ash trees across the state for several year, years now. And so Bill Davidson, I have to give a big shout out to him with the New Hampshire Department of Health, Health has been a tremendous resource and you know continues to be in sharing what they've learned along the way, as long as Nate Siegert, who is, works with the US Forest Service out of their Durham, New Hampshire office, they, he's been really helpful in this. Um, so the recommended pesticides and delivery system for forested settings is the same as what Joanne shared. Um, uh, in this case, uh, the Vermont, you know, you'd, it would need to be uh, treated by a certified Vermont pesticide applicator with a core. That's one uh, category. And then a category two license in this case, um, that's for forest pests, which is the common license that foresters, most foresters have for invasive plant management. That license will actually suffice for this treatment because that's where the majority of these treatments are being done. So, you know, as far as I'm aware, there are two main consulting forestry companies, Longview and Luke Hart, who are doing this type of work. There may be more that I just haven't heard of, um, but, but, you know, checking for those of you that have consulting foresters, you know, if this is of interest to you, checking in with your consulting forester to see if they do this work. Otherwise, there are um, foresters that um, are willing to do this. Uh, generally, you know, the cost is about $10, 10 to $12 per inch diameter. So not cheap, obviously, um, uh, certainly a worthy cause. Um, and then the companies would also charge um, extra for an initial visit in which you, um, they would sex the trees and select which trees would be best for treatment. So speaking of which, next slide, Maya, please. Great. So an answer to the question, how do we do this? Um, which trees and, and how many? Um, so the goal would be to treat 15 to 20 trees in a one to three acre area. area. So having the trees closer together, this really increases cross-pollination. Um, you know, as you'll remember, ash trees are male or female. Um, so it'll create sort of a single concentrated ash seed bank in the soil rather than sort of several dispersed ones uh, dispersed throughout kind of a larger area. So it's really important to select sort of the healthiest, most vigorous trees that are either dominant or co-dominant in the canopy. Um, Nate particularly recommends choosing mostly females and only, he says you'd only really need about 25% of those as male trees. Um, rationale being that pollen is likely to disperse pretty far and wide as, as ash is wind pollinated. So you don't need as much male pollen. 
And this, you know, thus allows you to preserve as many good seed trees um, as possible on a given site. So the optimal application is in the spring. So when it coincides with flowering and leaf expansion, and that's going to help distribute, um, you know, Judy talked about uh, the vascular system of the tree, the chemical is going to move through the vascular system, and it's going to control both the EAB and its larval stage. But if adult beetles are also feeding on the foliage, that they that will, they they will also die from ingestion of the chemical. Um, you know, according just another note on timing. You know, you can treat throughout most of the growing season, but forest surface researchers, you know, have found in long term studies that fallen while that fall injection can work, it tends to be less effective. So again, sort of thinking about if you're going to do this, targeting that application in the spring. So in 2020, uh, 20, oh gosh, it would have been 2019, I think at this point, but with funding from the Forest Service, BLT started treating groves of 20, mostly white, but we do have some black ash growing on some of the lands that we own around the state. Uh, next year we have more to do and we'll be joined by some of our nonprofit partners um, who will be treating trees on, uh, on their land. So for those of you who are able, we hope you'll join us in making sure that ash is uh, part of our future. So, you know, to that end, just in sort of summary, you know, we're not just talking about the, the potential extinction of three species of ash native to Vermont, but we're also talking about the loss uh, of species such as the 100 species of quote unquote bugs, uh, including 34 moss species that rely on North American ash trees for some part of their life cycle. And it really, you know, it's our ethical duty to do what we can to save ash species for their own intrinsic right to exist, but for also all the species, including ourselves, who depend on ash. So I hope we leave you today with a feeling of hope and some action steps for how you can join us um, in investing in the future of ash. So with that, Maya, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin, um, and all of our presenters. Thank you um, for all of that great information. Um, and we, you'll see on the screen here um, some upcoming events if you're interested in joining us. We also um, will be sending out, as Peter mentioned, a number of resources and a survey. Um, and the survey um, should also pop up for you as you leave um, this webinar today. And we would love um, to hear your feedback if you could take a few moments to fill that out. Um, and now we will move on to some questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, read some of the questions we've gotten here in the Q&A tool. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please use the Q&A instead of the chat. Um, and then we'll let our panelists um, jump in with some answers. So one question here, Ellen asks, how should infected cut trees be disposed of? Joanna, do you have some advice for that? Well, I, I could. I was going to actually ask Judy for the most up-to-date information. Is that okay, Judy? Um, sure, especially since you rescued me from my um, don't move firewood slide, which went went rogue and moved itself. Um, so yeah, disposal of ash wood, um, you can go to that vtinvasives.org website. And if you go to the EAB pages, there a list of resources, which includes resources for homeowners and woodlot owners, and that includes some disposal tips. But basically, you just need to think about if your trees are infested, what are you planning to do with them? And you know, we ask if you take them to the mill, um, if you could alert the mill owner that you're bringing EAB infested wood, so they'll jump it up and process it immediately, get rid of the bark, and dispose of the bark appropriately so that it's not. Um, going to uh, establish a new infestation at that location. If you just have um, you know, a, a single tree or two, maybe you wanna either burn the firewood yourself or if you're cutting it for firewood or give it to needy neighbors. Um, you know, If you are harvesting for use in lumber, like I said, just alert the mills. Um, if any of you can think of other scenarios, I can try to cover those too. But just to be thoughtful that you can move it to a place which is already infested, but please don't move your wood to a place that has no infestation. And you can use that map at vtinvasives.org to, to figure out um, where you wanna go. It is okay to move it 
from one infested area that's not contiguous with another, just, you know, again, be sensible. Don't like park your truck there for three weeks and then finish the trip. The goal okay. is to not start new infestations. Great, thank you, Judy. Does anyone else want to jump in with anything? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just also some merit in noting this the seasons. And sorry, Judy, if you did mention this, but trying to use wood before adult emerald ash borers start emerging, which is in June. So um, transporting, moving, processing your wood in the generally the winter months um, means that the larvae aren't turning into adults and flying away during that time. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see, we'll take another question here. Um, somebody asks, um, is there any funding available in Vermont for ash injections? I can say that the Urban and Community Forestry Program is offering grant funds that largely focus on planting of other species, tree species, in areas where you can show that you're losing community canopy due to losing ash trees. Insecticide treatment is not usually covered in that, um, in those grants, but it can be used as match funding for the grants. So that's in public places. Caitlin, maybe you know for private yeah, unfortunately, the only private would be nonprofits, um, and that was the, the the land trust secured some funding through the U.S. Forest Service that I should definitely note. Um, it was on my slide, but I didn't say it out loud. Um, their state and private forestry was what funded some of our work, um, but I'm not I'm not aware of any funding for private landowners, unfortunately. Okay, thank you both. Um, we have a question here. Um, how much research went into bringing in non-native wasps and are there any risks that come with that? I, I saw this question. I can start to tackle it. And Judy, I would I think you might know more, more than I do. Um, so feel free to jump in. But I was just doing a little bit of research. Um, and my understanding is that the research that went into the biocontrol release efforts was pretty extensive, um, looking at a variety of different um, natural predators that occur in like the Russian Far East. Um, and they, researchers went through, yeah, a variety of different predators looking at, okay, are they able to disperse? Are they host specific? Um, and narrowed it down to, I believe, four different species that are released in, in the US, but only three of them are able to survive in Vermont. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of lab research before anything was released into the wild. And I'm gonna paste um, one of those resources into the chat if I'm able to. And Judy, I'm gonna hand it off to you if you have any other comments. Yeah, I don't think my research is as up to date as yours, but what I do remember is that they're, um, the biocontrol agents are specific to Agrilus, to the genus, but they may not be specific to the species um, Agrilus planipennis which is an emerald ash borer. So they may um, also attack other native agrilis. Um, but, you know, um, presumably they will fall into ecological balance and not be so abundant as to wipe out all the agrilis. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. Is any work being done to breed resistant ash varieties, or is that considered a suboptimal solution? Yes, there is work being done to breed um, North American ash with ash native to Southeast Asia. Um, that kind of gets at another reason to slow the spread of emerald ash borer. The more time there is to to work on breeding resistant ash in North America, the better we can ensure some kind of, of future of ash in our landscape here in the Northeast. Um, that's all the information I can offer though. Can anyone else provide any more? But I guess it would be worth mentioning, and Peter, I don't know if I just saw you come off mute. <laughs> so fill in what I, what I, what I missed. Uh, but there's also a research project being conducted 
um, with numerous partners, including the Forest Service, on managing ash mortality, and it's to identify potential resistance. Um, it's called lingering ash. So uh, the Land Trust has um, some of these research plots set up on our property. It requires, you know, 40 trees that you're not going to harvest, and you're just going to let sort of EAB take its course and potentially identify some sort some resistance in some of those trees. Um, there's a webinar on it that Peter and Alaire with VLT did um, a couple of years ago. I can also put a link in the chat. And I think the link, Peter, I, I want to say you put it in our resources follow-up too um, for folks who are interested in that. They're looking, it's a citizen science project. If you have ash that you, you know, don't plan on harvesting or doing anything or treating with insecticide too, that's one of the other pieces, um, obviously. So um, definitely get in touch with these folks or get in touch with um, Peter or Lair and they can get you started on that. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Any anything else to add from anybody? Okay, great. Um, another question here: um, Are there best management, excuse me, best management practices specific to potentially impacted black ash, given its cultural and ecological significance? Sorry, what are BMPs? Best, best management practices. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I know of best management practices for black ash. I think one thing that I heard of heard early on was as, as Charlotte mentioned, um, black ash swamps are likely to transition to some other kind of natural community because the black ash will not be soaking up as much water. They'll be more inundated and trees will be less likely to survive. So one thing you could do is try to do some sort of a manipulation, some sort of a harvest that would, um, <clears throat> that would uh, make space for other trees that can grow in that kind of a, a situation, so in a swamp. So maybe favoring some of the other trees that are there already. We don't have a lot of pure black ash swamps around. Usually there's some up in the Northeast Kingdom, but they're usually fairly small and there are usually lots of other, um, other species mixed in with them. I don't know if other uh, panelists have ideas on this one. Yeah, I would add that um, Tony D'Amato, a, a UVM uh, forestry professor, he's done quite a bit of work in the Midwest where there are these large stands looking at underplantings and what species can be planted to help with that transition from um, black, a more black ash dominated system. Um, things like, depending on your location, swamp white oak, red maple, um, uh, there's a, I can again drop this a link to this paper in in the Q and A. Um, and then one other thing is if you are considering harvesting black ash uh, in a, just before emerald ash borer comes comes onto your um, property, do consider reaching out to basket makers, particularly indigenous basket makers, um, just because of the cultural significance of those trees. Great. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, and we're right at two o'clock, so I think we can stop there. Um, thank you again to all our panelists um, for this great information and to everyone who joined us today. Um, hopefully, we'll see you at another BLT event soon. Um, and again, we would really appreciate it if you would take a couple moments to fill out that survey and let us know, um, you know if you have any feedback for us. But thank you, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.